uh, hey, before I jump into the message, thank you so much. Uh, Jill and I counted our greatest joy and our greatest privilege to be pastors of this church for uh, the last 15 years. And at the height of our enjoyment, uh, the thing that produces in us the most smiles and laughter is to get to do life with you. Uh, we're really humbled by today, and uh, we're very, very grateful. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we're in uh, the third week of our Unnecessary Roughness series. And today I want to talk to you about great influence I want to talk to you about great influence. Um, this whole message series, what we're looking at is the, the raw reality, and you've experienced it already, that life has a way of making people bump into each other. It's just what happens. Circumstances conspire. Calendars collide. Things occur, and people bump into each other. That's normal. What we're trying to do in this message series, though, is not just identify that. We're trying to say, how do we acknowledge that that's true, and not give in to what so many people give in to. Not give ourselves to this unnecessary roughness that can happen in life. Because it does. You've worked with people like this. You, you've gone to school with people like this. You've encountered people like this when you're shopping. Maybe there are people in your own home like this. And normal stuff happens. I mean, stuff that isn't desirable, isn't awesome. It's just the stuff of life because life has this component. And when it happens, they do not bring to those moments a certain grace or patience or understanding. In fact, it's, it's almost as if those moments bring out a darkness. I, I hope you don't work for a boss like this. I, I pray you're not married to a person like this. And most of all, I hope you're not like this. Because followers of Jesus, here's what Jesus said, I'm not going to take you out of the world. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. That's called truth and advertising. Some people trying to sell Jesus, they try to pro pro project an idea that if you follow Jesus, you're kind of plucked from the world and you have no problems. That's a lie. If you buy that kind of Christianity, the first time something happens to you or the second time something happens to you, you discover the hollowness of your faith. But Jesus never offered that. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but I have overcome the world. And then often when he was talking to his disciples, he described a world where things happen. And then he would look at his disciples and he would say, that's how it happens in the world. And when those things happen, here's what other people do. And our next line is the line of the day. But not so with you. I've preached a few times, even in this building, on the not-so-with-you passages. It's the reality that the world can be challenging. You're going to have challenges. Sometimes it's a personality difference. Sometimes it's a communication style. Sometimes it's a misalignment of love languages. There's all kinds of reasons why you have challenges. And typically, when challenges come... If we're not careful in the world, it can bring about a dark side, a less than gracious side, a challenging side. And Jesus looks at disciples in those moments and says, not so with you. And that's why in our church, as we're trying to figure out how to become fully developing followers of Jesus, we have to regularly stop and return to the words of our leader, Jesus, and say, Jesus, how would you have us engage this very broken world? How would you have me engage this imperfect marriage? How would you have me engage this broken home? How would you have me engage this relational dynamic that is anything but fun right now? How would you have me engage the people I do life with deeply and shallowly because you're the coach. I just have the joy of being on your team. And there's nobody better to learn from than Jesus. I mean, just for 30 more seconds, explore with me what makes Jesus so awesome. So I, I'm going to put on hold just at the moment the, the theological implications that he was God. We're going to get to that. And he chose to put on the form of a man. We're going to get to that. And how awesome it is that uh, we can have a relationship with our Heavenly Father because of the work Jesus did. We're going to get to all that. But, but just for a moment, have you read enough of the New Testament? Have you heard enough to know that when people were around Jesus, they really loved him? I mean, they liked him. They didn't just tolerate him. He didn't just have good advice. And it wasn't like, a, it wasn't like they had to take a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down because it was just good for them. No, 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 no. They wanted to be near him. And he could say some of the most pointed things. It's a dichotomy, actually. Like, it's almost ironic that Jesus could say some of the most pointed things to people, and they still wanted to be near him. 
He could be very much a truth teller. But people feel still, uh, still felt loved by him. It's a pretty incredible thing. I mean, for the first several months of Jesus' ministry, he's surrounded by crowds who are just pressing in on him. People with needs, and sometimes that, that were very obvious, and sometimes people with needs that weren't so obvious. Like they had it going on. They were at the peak of their game. They were at the top of the social ladder. They still wanted to be near him. And yet, in their journey with Jesus, there came a point, not a, too long before he, he was put on a cross, that he started talking about the challenges of life, the challenges that were going to come to them, the fact that God calls disciples, followers, to pick up their own cross. And that was the moment at which people began to back away. Now, I just want to challenge you before we get into the, the meat of today. And what I have to say to you is actually, I believe, refreshing to hear. In fact, when we talk today, what's going to happen is you're going to hope, you're going to wish that somebody in your life would take what I'm talking about to heart. It'll be your boss. It'll be your spouse. It'll be your kids. And in that way, you're glad to lean in. But it was when Jesus started looking at individuals and saying, I want to talk to you about you picking up your cross, you denying yourself, you doing the hard thing for you. That's when people backed away. And I want to challenge you, disciples, today. Don't back away from the implication of what's being said for you. Like, embrace it for your spouse. Pray about it. Embrace it for your boss. Embrace it for your family. Embrace it for your friend. But don't back away from you because the greatest rewards from following Jesus do not come simply because you enjoy what he's saying and you like what looks like could be your future. The greatest joys that come from following Jesus happen when you follow him all the way, which includes pick up a cross that he's called you to pick up and carry it. And in the middle of that burden, in the middle of that challenge, find some joy. And this is what Jesus, by the way, tried to teach his original disciples. So if he tried to teach them, we shouldn't be surprised that he's trying to teach us. So our story today picks up with two brothers, James and John. James and John were in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, in your message notes, right at the top. And they've come to Jesus, and they've said, Jesus... We want you to do us a big favor. When you come in all your power, one of us wants to sit on your right hand, and the other one wants to sit on your left hand. Would you do this for us? I mean, we're with you. We're doing the thing. We're hanging out with you. We're helping it happen. It's clear. We're kind of in your inner circle. So when you come in your ultimate power, not the build up to power that we're in right now, when you get all the blessing of being you and all the awesomeness and look at the crowds and how great it's going to be, our simple request is we want to be, we don't want to be you, you're powerful, but we want to be like right next to you. Can we have that position? Can we be like general number one and general number two? Can we be, all right, not CEO, but what other titles can we have with the C in it? Can, can we be one of those? Because that's what we want. Now, it's interesting, there's 12 disciples, this is two. When the other disciples heard this, what do you think their reaction was? They were mad. Now, I've pondered, why did they get mad? Like, did they get mad because James and John asked first? That's what I think. I think they all actually may have wanted that. But James and John had the gall to ask first. I think that's why. The other part is like, maybe they pictured, it's clear James and John are kind of favorited. I mean, their names are used all the time in the Gospels, right? So... If they're kind of favorited, what's it going to look like? I mean, because already we kind of know they're favorited. But what's it going to look like if they're more favorited? Well, that's going to stink to not be more favorited. We're not even fit. We're like out here three concentric circles away from... We <laughs> Look, maybe I'm not going to be close, but even if I'm... You certainly can't be. Because that's the kind of thing... Come on. You've seen it, right? School, your sports team, your, your work. That's the kind of thing that happened. When people and egos and opportunities and sometimes just life makes people bump into each other. It just forces things, doesn't it? And sometimes from some dark recess of the heart, things will come out because it's there. So out of the abundance, the mouth will speak. Things will come out and you'll say or you'll do or you'll feel. I mean, perhaps you're mature enough you don't say and do. But you'll feel some of the most dark 
and ungodly and unchristlike things. Well, let's look at what happened when uh, James and John made this request. Mark 10, 41 through 45. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John, and Jesus called them together, all of them now, and he said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. For even the Son of Man did not come to, serve, uh, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when Jesus heard James and John, and then the little fight that broke out among the twelve, the grumbling that occurred, he called them all together and he said, look, I get it. All you've really seen from people who had privilege, from people who had position, from people who had authority, all you've ever really seen, it's so common, is that people who have those positions, they tend to lord it over others. They tend to take advantage of their position and maximize it to the expense of others. They tend to exercise their authority. I get it. That's why you're doing this. Because it's all around you. It's all you've seen. You saw your parents do some of that. You've seen your coworkers do some of that. You've seen your friends do some You've done some of it. It's all you've seen. But in the kingdom of God, where God's actually in charge, and where heaven's values get lived out on earth. Remember the Lord's Prayer? On earth, even as it is in heaven. When heaven's values get lived out on earth, not so with you. Now, in that passage, many of you know that the Bible was originally written in Greek, and it's translated into English. And so in the, in the, in the Greek, Jesus is talking about the great ones. The great ones. The Greek word there is megaloi. We get our word mega from it. The great ones. So the great ones, they lord it over you. They step on you. They take advantage. You, you work at their pleasure, and when you work at their pleasure, it, yeah, you might get paid, but it really benefits them. Have you ever had a boss like this? Like, like he goes to their head? Like, yeah, I remember even like uh, playing a little bit of sports. You know, I wasn't really into it. But a little bit of sports when I was kind of growing up, and like we would just have a, a neighborhood team, and somebody would be coach, you know, a leader for the day, and it, Sometimes it would go to their heads. And I wasn't young or old enough or mature enough at the time to go, hey, bro, cool it out. We're just on the corner lot playing ball. You don't have any real power. I mean, it, you know what I'm talking You've seen it. These are the megaloi, the great ones. And it begs the question, how do you get to be great? How do you get to be great? Because I, I don't know you all. I know some of you really well. Some of you I don't know that well. But I think I know enough about people that deep down in all of us, there is the desire to be great. And it expresses itself a lot of different ways. For some of us, that includes a certain amount of visible leadership and influence, and that's fine. For some of us, it doesn't, and, and that's fine. But all of us want, and what I mean is, is that we all want for our lives to count, for it to have mattered. Whether you've gone through the little exercise that Stephen Covey and the seven... Habits of highly effective people talks about or not. Would you imagine your funeral and people are there and they're talking? And what do you want them to say? And then backwards engineer, you know, what you want them to say. So become the kind of person that at your funeral, they say the great things. They describe you as a megaloy, a great person. Uh, whether you've gone through that or not, I bet you that you would like to imagine that when you leave, you leave a vacuum not just because you are around, but because your life touched other lives. By the way, that's not your unbridled ego talking. That's your heavenly father's thumbprint on you. That your life matters. You're made in his image. He, give you, he gave you a design and a purpose. And you actually have a purpose to discover. And when you walk in that purpose, what will happen is, is you'll actually feel. You'll actually live. Megaloid. Great according to God. 
all of us want to be great, which is wonderful. But we live around people sometimes in their quest to be great, that the way they do it, it we should be throwing flags on the field, shouldn't we? It's a little unnecessarily rough. It's not required. It's just the way it is. And it's so commonplace. Like, do you remember when you just started discovering how commonplace it was? Like, maybe in your childhood you had a, a special childhood and you didn't have to deal with the realities of life until about middle school. But typically, if not before, somewhere around middle school, most everybody comes face to face with just how ugly this world can be. And in somebody's minor vision to be great, socially, at the lunch table, in the locker room, on the field, in the classroom, somebody's minor vision to be great presses up against you in a way that leaves you frustrated and hurt and disappointed and your eyes open a little bit. Part of what makes middle school so rough because up until about middle school, girls are just nice and after that, dear Jesus, it's time for an exorcism. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Parents of middle schoolers, am I telling the truth? Kids can be mean. So as parents, you try to wrangle them. That's exactly what Jesus was doing with his disciples. Hey, you're not in middle school anymore. Time to put some of that away. Not so with you. Now the challenge here is that sometimes because life can be ugly and we've seen people with position and authority abuse it, it's real easy to kind of reject it all the way. And yet that doesn't work either. In fact, if we define leadership as influence, leadership is influence in your message notes, it's, it's what you need in order for your life to count, it's the ability to have your life touch somebody else's, sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's indirect, sometimes it's because of positional authority, sometimes it's just the power of what's happening in your life affects them. If leadership is influence, the truth is, is that you and I need it. That's a good thing. A leadership is me hoping that my life does what the Bible calls me to do as a husband for my wife. It helps sanctify her, grow her, my I'm called to serve her and love her as Christ served and loved the church. And when I do that, my hope is, is that she presses and is empowered to press more fully into what God has called her to do. So I want the influence of my life to influence her life. I pray that I have influence over my kids. Now, as they're pressing into adulthood. I mean, I remember those days around middle school when it was no longer because dad said, and just the inflection of my voice could make them stop on a dime. Somewhere about middle school, all my kids lost that. I don't know what happened. But it was no longer just raw presence in the room. They started getting an opinion. I think it happens at puberty. Like hormones happen, and you get an opinion. And then you can't help it. You have to say it at the worst times in the worst ways. Right? And so I hope that I don't just have position. You're the dad. Now, I'll never say it if I need to. Didn't think I ever would. Never thought I'd hear myself saying, I'm the dad in this family, so shut up and follow me. Um, but I have. I've used that exact phrase. Um, now I'm not saying it's my best moment, but I've done it. I, I hope I don't have to rely on position. What I hope is, especially as they get older, I have ongoing influence. Because the truth is, when I step back, I don't want to control them. I actually want them to live their life with the Lord, with the thumbprint he's put on them, but I do want to have influence so that I can help, encourage, speak life, speak warning. And when I speak, it's taking, taken seriously. That's what I want. And I want that in almost every area of life. Truthfully, I want to have influence over you. I don't want to control your life. If you try to get me to control your life and take over, it ain't going to go well. Part of me will want to. And when, we, when it happens, it ain't going to be good. And even if we do everything right, it ain't going to be your win. But as a pastor, what I really want is I want to have some influence. I want to have influence as a church in our community. I don't know that we're going to be the leading church in some ways, but we can be 
a leading church in the sense that we have influence on people, and they know that there's a place where there's love. And we can have such a reputation in this community that when people need love, they need some encouragement, they're ready to grow, they're ready to make a change, they're ready that they think at the top of their list about our church. That's influence. And it's a good thing. And the challenge is, is that the enemy of your soul would like you to fall off one of two sides. Become so into influence that it drives you. Become so into leadership that it drives you and you become a megaloy. Right? But the megaloy in this first example is the megaloy described by Jesus' words to James and John. They lorded over they press their authority. They rule over. You're there to serve them. I hope that doesn't happen. The other extreme to avoid is the extreme that over here, you're so frustrated by megaloy and how it happens and what you've seen and what you've experienced and what your friends have gone through that you just reject it all out together. And I actually think in our culture right now, there's almost a rejection and an enjoyment of rejection of authority and influence. And I understand it. It's deserved in many ways. And so like when I was teaching high school for a few years, I was right on the cusp of a massive cultural shift. It had just begun to turn. And I'm going to sound like an old man for just a second. I'm 50 right now. That's the truth. I'm 50. So I get to sound like an old man on occasion. I've earned it, all right? So... When I was a kid, if I got in trouble at school, do you know what my parents said? And I, listen, I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you the change. If I got in trouble at school, you know what happened? I got in trouble at home, and then we talked about what happened. Because the idea was, I'm not saying it was all good, but the idea was is that that's an authority figure who has care and responsibility. And if I make it hard for her or him, and, it, and if it comes to the point of me being reprimanded in some way, then when I get home, my parents are going to reinforce that idea. They're going to engage that idea. We're going to start from the premise, I probably messed up somewhere. Now, maybe I didn't, but the truth is, is every time it happened, I had. That, that's just me. I, I was fortunate. When I was teaching high school, it began to shift. And every problem, it seemed like, that ever happened in the classroom was no longer the responsibility of the child. It was the responsibility of the teacher. And I get that in every situation, a teacher has responsibility. But the conversations with parents didn't seem like we were on the same side. It seemed like the parents were on the side of the child, and I was the enemy far too often. And honestly, I was done with that junk. I wasn't willing to do it. I used it as an example to express what is happening in our culture. And I want to push today against the two sides so that we can be a not-so-with-you kind of people. I hope you'll press into your greatness, your megaloy, but not this way. Not the thumb on other people. They serve you. You lord it over them. And I hope that you're not just a reject authority because that's what's in vogue. That seems right. And because there's been a handful of people who in their quest for megaloy bled over onto you. There is a better way. A much better way. Because the truth is, is that Jesus does not reject leadership. Or even the use of power. In fact, he simply redefines it. He re redefines it on a multitude of levels. He redefines the goal of it. He redefines the process of it. So both the, the unmeasurable, hidden side of the quest for megaloy, like what's driving you, he addresses that. Not to serve yourself, but to serve others. And then, in the pages of the Bible for disciples, he regularly talks about how we're to go about using our quest for influence and greatness in, in mechanical ways so that we don't bump up against other people that should require a foul on the field, right? A flag. Boom. Shouldn't have to happen. So leadership is not about titles for Jesus. It's not about your position. It's about influencing other people, influencing other people. And I think that this church has a remarkable ability as we stand on the, the brink of going into our 16th year to have incredible influence over others. And I want to take you, uh, first of all, to a, a common cultural phenomenon from the 1970s 
a book called Dress for Success. How many of you have ever heard of this book? Real quick, raise your hand. Six million copies sold. Guy made a, a bundle of money, John Malloy. And John Malloy had done some research and discovered how every single person can press into their megaloid, into their greatness. And what he said is that it wasn't so much a function of all these other things. If you do the research, he said, there's statistical data that would prove it largely comes down to how you dress. And there are four basic things that you must avoid if you want to be a success. First of all, you can't let a fashion designer dress you because those things come and go. You can't dress out of your background because if you're from the hills, you're going to dress like you're from the hills. And if you're from the hills, you'll only be good in the hills, but you won't have the megaloy you want. And you can't be dressed by a sales clerk because they're just trying to make the sale. And number four, you can't be dressed by the most common offense of all to keep you from reaching your own megaloy. You can't be dressed by your spouse. This is what I tell Jill all the time. That according to John Malloy, she doesn't get an opinion. Now, what Malloy says is that Research will tell you what success looks like. And here's what it looks like. I'll sum up the book. You don't have to spend the $14.95 on it. It looks like dressing in dark colors consistently. There you go. Dress for success in a sentence. Dress in dark colors consistently. And when you do that, like, like the little mayor of a small Midwestern town who became governor. He doesn't name him in the book. He just says it happened. I'm suspicious. But if you do that, you will become great because people who dress in dark colors become great and six million books sold and i'm not saying there's not something to how you dress clearly there is but there's another book that sold a whole lot more copies that disciples of jesus take much more seriously and the bible in this not so with you stuff primarily for the next few minutes philippians chapter two if you want to thumb there or on your message notes Jesus is going to mechanically say, if your heart is to be great and you don't want to be one of them, let me show you how. So, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement, as Paul writes to the Philippians, if you have any encouragement from being with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any of this stuff's happening, if any tenderness and compassion then make it my joy, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and in one mind. He's talking to the whole church. Here's what I want for you. I want you to make my joy complete. Here's how you'll do it. Being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. That's what was going on with James and John. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. In your message notes, we pick up with uh, verse um, 5, I believe it is. So in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, here's mechanics. Here's what Jesus did. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. It's interesting. Jesus says to James and John and the other disciples... You know that those who have authority, they lord it over other people. And if there was ever anybody that had the right and the privilege to lord it over others, it is the Lord. But when Paul talks about what Jesus did, he had the right and privilege to lord it over, but he didn't do that. He's in the very nature of God, but he didn't consider this equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He is God. He has every advantage in the world, but instead of using that for his own good... He leveraged his influence for the benefit of others. Rather, verse 7, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, the most horrific, shameful way to die, reserved for criminals in the Roman Empire. Therefore, because of this, verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So in this beautiful passage 
incredibly complex and very simple at the same time. Jesus, who has every authority to lord it over people, says, I'm here not to be, he repeats, Paul uses his own words to repeat the same sentiment that Jesus said to James and John. Jesus did not come to be served out of his greatness. He came to use his greatness to serve others. Every bit of influence he had was for the benefit of other people. And when that happened in the kingdom of God, here's what happened. That is the path to greatness. It's simple to understand that according to the kingdom of God, the way you become great is when you become a servant. And at the moment you understand that, and everybody in this room, I'm assuming, can understand that simple concept. I'm not asking you to agree it, embrace it, love it, and understand it all. But on a simple level, you can certainly understand that according to Jesus, the kingdom of God, according to Paul, the way the kingdom of God works, the way disciples are to become great to God, is that you use every bit of your influence for the benefit of other people. You leverage for their good. And when you do that, the math of the kingdom of God goes like this. You actually become megaloi. That's how you become megaloi. So, if the heart is to serve, here's how you become megaloi. Mechanics, you serve. If your heart has become great, mechanics, you serve. That's how you do it. And we don't pull this from some nice idea. We pull this from Jesus. And mechanically, how it looked for him was, as he came and decided, even though I'm Lord... In fact, because I'm God, I'm not here to rule over you. Has the authority, can, exercises that authority, but even when he does, he does it for the benefit and for the good of the people he came to serve. Now imagine this, would you, for just a minute. Imagine if everybody in your life who has ever had influence in your life, formal, positional influence, informal, relational influence, Imagine if every one of those people had in their heart a desire to be megaloi. They do. But in that desire, they were guided by the principles of the kingdom of God. That they're to use their quest for greatness, their influence, their position, not simply for themselves. In fact, not for themselves at all. They're to use it to serve others. I want you to imagine for, with me just a second. Imagine your worst job situation. You know the, the, the rule here, right? Generally speaking, people don't quit jobs. If they do, those stories are very easy to tell. Uh, they got a better position. Uh, they moved away. Life changed. They had to make a change. Generally, people don't quit jobs. They generally quit their bosses, right? You know this? That's generally what happens. It's very, very humbling, by the way, if you're a boss. They generally quit bosses. And the reason they do is on the principles often that we're talking about. Imagine if, in your worst job situation, your boss believed that the path to his or her own greatness was not using you, taking advantage of you, treating you like a cog in a machine, but the greatest path to his or her own greatness was actually serving you to become what you could become, to discovering what God has called you to do. Discovering how you can make a contribution and then being valued for the contribution you make. Imagine how your worst job situation would have been different if somebody up the chain who had megaloi by position would have believed Jesus was accurate when he said, the path to greatness is really through serving. Wouldn't it have been better for you? Have you are you old enough yet to have had a really, really stinky job? And what made it stinky? Maybe it was stinky because the circumstances of the job just stink. And, but often it's stinky because of the people, right? And what if the people who had influence, the formal positional influence, leveraged it for the good stuff? Not just for them, but for the people around them. Let's go one more. What if you grew up in a home where you saw your dad and mom who have both positional and... and um, and just influential authority in your life. What if you saw a dad and mom who have incredible influence, leverage their influence, not towards each other and towards the family, not simply in authoritative ways, do what I say and it's the highway. I believe that's valid and true, 
But they didn't leverage that, all right? What they leveraged instead was every bit of their influence and authority, not simply to get you to change your behavior, but to get you to grow and develop. And they used their authority to serve your goodwill in your own life. So the rules were constructed in the home you grew up in, not arbitrarily, but they were constructed so that there could be a certain amount of protection over the foolishness of a child. The Bible says foolishness abounds in the heart of a child. And so the parents have some rules to do that. But when you got old enough and you were by design, by just the nature of growing up, you would start pressing against some of those stories. What if there was room to discuss the why behind those and you could have conversations even if the rules didn't bend? Because that's sometimes what authority has to do. What difference would it have made? What, what difference would it make in your own life, for those of you that are married, if between you and your spouse, you deeply believed the path to greatness was to serve each other? I'm telling you, this would revolutionize your home. If you actually believed that Jesus was a truth teller and that his truth was practical, so that he would say, you actually can't be great until you serve. Like, you'll never, you'll never be great. Oh, you may get to the position of being able to lord it over people. By the way, that's how the pyramids were built. So you can leave a legacy, man. You can do that. But I don't think many people who understand the dynamics of the pyramid, pyramids want to leave that kind of legacy. Imagine. Not meant to be political at all. Imagine over the last 50 years if leaders around the globe saw their elected and appointed positions as an opportunity to serve rather than be served. Imagine what difference it would make. So I'm not talking here today about some neat little spiritual tidbit. I'm talking about a life-changing, world-changing dynamic that Jesus was not ambiguous on. This does not require a PhD in theology. If you wanted to leave today, you would be imperfect, but you could immediately begin practicing what we're talking about. Maybe not in the world at large, but in your world at large. You could do it at home, on the way home today. You're here, in part, to serve. Leverage your influence for the benefit of others. Now, there are a couple challenges here. Because when I say this, especially some people have been hurt by the dynamic of the mechaloi who are going about it the wrong way. Sometimes those people have in mind that anything that makes them uncomfortable, anything that pushes, anything that flexes authority is automatically negative. And that is not at all what the Bible is encouraging us to embrace. We're not anarchists here. We're not anti-authoritarian just for the sake of being anti-authoritarian. So I want to walk you through four major tension points with what we're talking about here and see if you can relate. All right? Let me give you the first blank and then we'll talk about it. A leader needs to be decisive, but also practice submission. So the first tension point is that a leader, in order to be a person of impact, needs to be a decisive person, a person who has influence, and you have influence. So when I say leader, you can uh, substitute the phrase, a person who has influence. So a person who has influence needs to be a decisive person. They have to make the call, especially difficult calls. You have to do this in your own life. You have to make difficult calls. And it's a huge part of leading yourself effectively. There seems to be in early adulthood, late adolescence, a real hesitance to make the call. I saw this when I was teaching high school, when kids had a hard time deciding where to go to school. As they were going to school, who to date. As they were dating Is this the time to get married? And which job? Because they knew that if they opened one door and walked through it, the others shut automatically. So I get it. It can be hard. But a person who leverages influence in the mind and heart of Jesus, with that in their their motivating dynamics, they're going to have to be a decisive person. These are the kind of people that when things need to be done, you can turn to them and they can call the ball. And when this doesn't happen, there's all kinds of uncertainty and confusion. 
So in a family, in an organization, in a church where people cannot make decisions, ultimately, there is ultimately disaster. My hunch is, in your life right now, there are things you're putting off that you have enough data to make a decision on, and you need to make the decision to act, to do, to think, to move. But it's just overwhelming to think about that, and certainly overwhelming to do it. And so there's drift, there's uncertainty, there's confusion. People don't know what's going on. This happens in marriages all the time. Like my hunch is there's a a bunch of people in the room. This is why we do uh, Financial Peace University. And you have all the data at bay right now. It's like in front of you that we should be doing our family finances differently. You know it. So knowing is not the challenge. But you're indecisive on what to do in light of the knowledge. And it's probably time for a leader in the family to step up and say, we're going to do this. Come on. It's good for all of us. Let's do it together. But this indecisiveness that happens actually lowers the ability to have influence, to make a difference, to press into your own megaloy the way that Jesus would like you to. So decisiveness is a good thing. Some of you have some decisions to make, and you've been putting them off. And that's the one side. But on the other side, there's a danger. The danger is is that being in a position of power can go to your head, where you're used to making calls, and people just do it because of your position or because of the influence you have in their life. And this is where disciples have to press in to what Jesus wants. And the way to do that is to not simply be a person who can make a call, but to also walk in submission to the authorities in your life. It's very challenging to do. The most mature disciple among us still regularly wrestles with what does it mean to follow Jesus in quick obedience. My most well-behaved child, that is the most compliant to our wishes, whichever one that is, and the season changes, even when they're at the peak of their game and being well-behaved, you can still see the mechanics in their brain when they press up against something. And at that moment, they have a decision to make. Decision? And what does submission look like in the middle of it? It's a challenging thing to navigate, but the good leaders, the people who've had real influence in your life, whether they had a position or not, they navigated this well. They knew when and went ahead and had conversations with you that may have been awkward. You understand how many people want to have a conversation with you but won't? It's just true. But good leaders who leveraged their influence in your life decided that conversation needs to happen, and then they did it. And when they did it, they made a decision. And when they did, it helped you. But the other thing that makes that leader influential in your life, not just because they may have said some things that were hard to hear, but because you saw in their life a certain quality that made their words credible. And what made their words credible wasn't just their expertise in some skill set, but they lived a submitted life to good practice, good values, good words, good tone. And they submitted their agenda to good things. I'm going to tell you, the people that you most admire and I most admire, we don't admire them simply for their titles. We admire them because they know how to operate within authority and its limits. And all of us are sickened by people who have position and authority and they push their, their rights. They push their agenda and it seems like they're completely self-serving. It seems to me, in some real sense, that out of all of Jesus' complex teachings, this is the easiest to embrace. Because it's immediately obvious without, with, with the most basic reflection that self-serving leaders who can't submit themselves to the good of all. This is what we saw in that little video clip. A good leader works for the team, not himself. It seems obvious to me that out of all of Jesus' teaching, this is crystal clear. You don't even really need much spiritual insight to understand it. Some of the best leadership books being written today focus on this point. So let me just ask you real quick, how are you on being decisive, and how are you on being submitted to authority? How are you on being decisive about what you need to be decisive about, and how are you about submitting to authority? Because in that tension point, there's opportunity for you to thrive as a disciple and press into your megaloy without being one of those that Jesus said we should not be. Number two. A leader needs to offer tough-minded accountability to the people around them, but also practice tender-hearted compassion. This is hard to do. 
So parents, how do you tell your kids, we're not going to tolerate that behavior around here anymore? I mean, do you just leverage fear and position? Or can you do it in a way where they know that your heart is for them? And maybe they can't know it at 18 years old, but maybe they can know it at 30 as they reflect back on where you are and what's happened to them. The challenge, if you want to leverage your influence, I believe, is that you've got to hold people, you've got to sometimes say, hey, let me just use the sports metaphor, and I'll probably break, it'll probably break down, but here we go. There's been some play here. There's been some movement on the field, but I'm going to call foul right now because that's what leaders do, you understand. They call foul. If you're in a room and somebody's being mistreated, even if it's not you, if you're a leader, you stand up and you say to the group, we're going to pause right now because the way you're talking to her is not fair. It's not healthy. And I think there's a better way, and I think you're a big enough person to reward what you're saying in a way that doesn't diminish her as a person, instead makes your point, and I think we'll actually hear you better. Now, you find your own words, but that's what leaders do in groups when people are being taken advantage of. But you have to do it in a way you don't come off like a jerk, right? That's the challenge. Your boss has a responsibility to make sure you show up for work on time, but he has to be or she has to be compassionate about what might be going on in your life. So the first couple times, there's circumstances, but if it's happening 10 times a month, so which is it, compassion or accountability? It's both. It's both. And the challenge to leverage influence to be great is to walk in this tension. And I believe that one of the primary ways to do this is to pray. It's to pray for the people uh, that you're doing life with, especially if you feel compelled to call foul on something. Pray for them. Let God touch your heart about them. You want to have a tough conversation with your spouse? Before you do it, pray for them. God. And I don't mean pray like Old Testament prayers. Like, God, let the heavens rain down on them. Cause the rocks to fall upon my enemies. That's not what I'm talking about. You can find some of that in the Old Testament. It's always fascinating to me. I'm talking about more New Testament kinds of prayers. God, you have an agenda. You love this person. Help me. I need to have this conversation. When I do it, I don't want to just be leveraging a point. I want them to know my heart is for them. But we have a responsibility together. They sign documents. We've agreed, and we're off play. There's, there's a flag on the field. And so somebody's got to call the ball. I just want to do it with compassion. You have to navigate that, and you can, and the Spirit of God will help you. Number three, a leader needs to be effectively resourceful, but also walk in active dependence on God's provision. Some of the best leaders you know, the reason they got to the positions they have formally and informally is they know how to rally resources and leverage them for some common good. They can raise money. They can grow a team. They can find time in busy schedules. And they get stuff done. They move things forward. The challenge with that is that it can internalize. And you can think of yourself as very independent when you can do that. But a good godly leader is not just one who gathers resources to leverage for the common good. They also understand that at every step of the way, no matter how talented they are, they're completely dependent upon God. When you're around people like this, it's humbling. Because you can acknowledge their greatness. And oh my goodness, like you're really good at this. And it's amazing how kind and nice and humble you are. You know, the best leaders aren't just good at stuff. The best parents aren't just good at it. There's a humility that goes into the, all that they do. It's almost as if they know... Yeah, there's some things I can do, but ultimately I can't do anything worthwhile sustaining without God's help and the help of others, typically. And this is the challenge in leadership, in influence, in life. You deal with these things all the time. And the challenge is, is you can see them in others, and it's difficult to see in yourself. But I mean, you know what I'm talking about when you see it in others. Imagine what it would look like if everybody in this room and everybody that's watching online were to stop for just a little while looking at how these things relate to others and processing how others leverage their influence and think for themselves, how do I leverage mine? And what would Jesus call me to do? Number four, a leader needs a deep sense of urgency, but also a relaxed enjoyment of the journey. We call this a dichotomy. Because leaders are the people who often in the room, people who have influence are the ones who stand up sometimes and say, we got to do this. The clock is ticking. We don't have forever. Some of my favorite pastors, they do this when they preach. One day Jesus is coming back, friends. 
We only have a certain amount of time. We don't even know how much time it is. It's an urgent time to get about the Lord's business. So yeah, so you're going to heaven. Is that it? No, 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 no. It's urgent. We have work to do. But when they do it, they also have the ability to be relaxed and enjoy the journey along the way. So think about your life for just a moment. Think about if you could be the kind of leader in your own life who was both decisive and at the same and could leverage and make the call and at the same time was submitted to the appropriate authority and the real values that were around them. Think about if you could actually help people be held accountable and when you did it, you could be compassionate as well. And think about if you could be incredibly resourceful and almost it looks like could act independent but instead you walked with a certain amount of understanding that you're dependent on the Lord and those around you. And then think for just a moment about if you could pick up speed at the things you already know you should be about. But as you picked up speed, you didn't get stressed. You could enjoy the journey more. I offer these to stretch you today. I offer these to give you something to pray about. So there are eight words, eight blanks. My hunch is one or two of those is an area that you should be praying about and leaning into. I tell you, I'm going to tell you what's at stake. If you'll do it, here's what's going to happen. It's not going to be an overnight change. But you'll see changes in your quest to become great, to make your life count. You'll see changes, and if you believe Jesus is telling the truth, what I'm about to say you'll believe is true. You'll see changes that don't diminish you as a human being, but actually elevate you to a position of honor and influence. Your life will actually become greater, even as you become less. This is what Jesus promised us. And I think it's about time we take him at his word. So why don't you grab out your connect card? And let's take a couple steps together. Every week around here, we uh, give people a chance to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. So next step A says, today I'm making Jesus my Lord and Savior. To do this, you simply trust the work Jesus did for you. It's an incredibly humbling act. God, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. None of my work will do it. So I'm going to trust the work you did when you died on the cross and was resurrected. I'm going to trust that work alone. I'm going to believe that the work you did if I trust it, can save me. And that's what Next Step A encourages you to do. If you want to do that, take the pen, check Next Step A. When the offering bucket comes by in a moment or so, you'll drop it in there. We'll communicate with you. We're not going to harass you. I'll tell you what it looks like to be a child of God, to be in God's family. And then when we pray over our offering and our steps, I'm going to give you a chance to say to God, God, save me. Wash away my sins. I want to follow you. I want to be in your family. And then Next Step B, I want to be baptized on October 13th. Or uh, December 8th, in case you're keeping score, that's just like a couple weeks away, October 13th. So check the box, we'll answer your questions. Next step C says, uh, here's an opportunity, I hope you'll pray with me. Pray this prayer each morning. Father, today lead me, help me to follow your leadership and influence, uh, those that you put in my path. Father, today lead me, help me to follow your leadership and influence, those you put in my path. All right? And I think if you pray that way, God will open doors for you. Next step, D, says, I'm interested in dedicating my child on October 13th, so baptisms and dedications. If you have a child that you'd like to be dedicated, if you have a family member, you know, now is the time. We need a couple of days to get things ready, so check the box. Somebody will be in touch with you, and we can follow that up. And then next step, E, says, sign me up for the local serve on October 5th. October 5th is the next Saturday, the first Saturday of every month. We serve our community. If you check this box, we'll send you that information, and then you can show up, all right? So why don't you set that aside? If you call this church home, I want to give you a chance to give back to God a portion of what he's blessed you with.